along with the, the community theme that we have here at Chautauqua, that really you can't uh, you don't really have many other places, I don't think. <clears throat> the first one, I think everybody will know this song. <laughs> in the world today makes everything you got taking away from all your worries sure would help a lot wouldn't you like to get away all those nights when you got no lights the check is in the mail and your little angel on the cat up by his tail and your third fiance didn't show can't walk down the street here without at least 50 people knowing my name, or, or vice versa. What is so, it? Well, see, if I, okay, she doesn't count. She's, she's the 51st person I saw. But I, I actually heard that in, on the radio the other day, and I was like, I'm going to do that song. But I, I figured it was kind of perfect. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> well, let's, let's see. There's another, uh, another one I wanted to do. Uh, because most of the people that I know here uh, are family, friends, or people that I've just met over the years. And you always hear about uh, love stories that, that happen here, specifically. There's so many couples that I can think of that are recently married, or married a long time ago, or uh, have since passed away, but were married here, or met here, or got engaged here, or had their first date here, or something like that. And so, there's, for me, there's, there's I mean, my parents met here, so <laughs> that should... That should uh, show you that it really—I mean, it really—is uh, about a place of love here, at least for for me. And I, like I said, it, you, you kind of see that as as the as you walk around the community. And so that's what uh, this next song <coughs> is about. Perhaps love is like a resting place, a shelter from the storm. It exists to give you comfort. It is there to keep you warm. And in those times of trouble, when you are most alone, the memory of love will bring you home. Perhaps love is like a window, perhaps an open door. It invites you to come closer, it wants to show you more. And even if you lose yourself and don't know what to do, the memory of love will see you through. Hold up, the sun is like a cloud, the sun is strong as steel. There's some way of living, there's some way to feel. And some say love is holding on, and some say letting go. Some say love is everything, and some say they don't know. Perhaps love is like the ocean, full of conflict, full of change. Like a fire when it's cold outside, or thunder when it rains. If I should live forever and all my dreams come true, my memories of love will be of you. Dr. 
I think I, I chose this one really because it's all about, I think for me this is a song about innocence and there's, a, I think there's like a, a childlike sense of when you, when you come to the grounds here. It's just such a, a different feel as, as we all, as we all know and so that's what for me that this song kind of represents. <clears throat> Disappeared all too soon. But I wandered much further today than I should. And I can't seem to find my way back to the wood. So help me if you can. I've got to get back to the house I do corner by one. You'd be surprised there's so much to be done. Down all the bees in the hive. Chase all the clouds from the skies. Back to the day. Should ever not show up at two o'clock? I know who I'm going to find. <laughs> <laughs> All right, deal. deal. Oh, thank you. What a lovely way to start because uh, all the songs you chose, Zach, really do speak about Chautauqua. Thanks. And pretty much, I think, um, prepare us for the story that I'm going to share that uh, Jesse Robert wrote for us. 1920. But first, I want to introduce one of my new colleagues, um, and I'm very pleased that he's here tonight because he's our new director for literary arts, and uh, this is a book review. So, uh, Sonny Taname, please let everybody welcome you. And girlfriend, please stand up. We're so happy to have both of you here. Not exactly new to Chautauqua. He's been here for two seasons uh, with the um, the Kent University um, um, Maker Space Poetry project that we had on the plaza for two years, and it's moved over to the uh, veranda. Uh, but but he really um, parlayed that experience into running everything. <laughs> so. I'm so glad you're here. And he's also in charge of CLSC, and you're going to hear a lot about CLSC tonight. So this is, this is a good um, um, background for you. So Chautauqua, in 1920, 100 years ago, what do we need to remember now for the next 100 years? That's the question that I'm putting out there. And the reason I gave you all the uh, um, note cards, so you can write down your thoughts and share whatever with us, and I'm going to hope we have time. Um, so here we go. Um, I want to first thank Greg for listening to his infallible inspiration and suggesting that somebody, and that would be me, uh, would give us all a reason to pause and think about Chautauqua in this significant year of 2020. 
from the vantage point of looking back to appreciate Chautauqua as it had lived up to that point in 40, for 46 years. In other words, to literally use 2020 hindsight vision to do a self-assessment of who we were then and who we are now. So tonight we're, we are here to do what Chautauqua does best, and that is to dialogue, and I hope we will do that. So I'm going to uh, give us some things to ponder, and then I'm hoping that you will share your responses and thoughts. And I hope they have to throw us out. <clears throat> So you have a card on which to write your thoughts, which I hope you will share with us, and I'm going to hope that I don't talk too long so we can have time for conversation. So I want to start by sharing an article that, was, that appeared in the New York Times two weeks ago on February 8th. Some of you may have seen it. It was written by Dr. Ted Widmer, who is a distinguished lecturer at the Macaulay Honors College of City University of New York. He titled the article, what will the next decade bring? The 1920s offer an answer. Anyone see that? Okay, this will be interesting. Yep, <laughs> not a surprise. Okay, good. Here is his retrospective. He said, It has been a long time since the winter of 1920, but the old fault lines are still visible. As the 1920s got underway, for President Woodrow Wilson, the world was indeed falling apart as the new decade began. A year earlier, Wilson had been the people's champion, striving to complete peace talks with Germany and make the world safe for democracy. It was not to be, in part because Wilson was no longer the bold leader he once was. The man who had done more than any other to evangelize for the new order that he envisioned was a shell of his former self having suffered a, a series of debilitating strokes during his fall campaign to raise support for the Treaty of Versailles. And this will bring back memories from your history classes. If Wilson's body seemed to be struggling against itself, the same could be said of the country at large, deeply divided as the new decade began. This was 1920. The long year of 1919 had unleashed a tremendous energy as the Doughboys came home and young people began to plot out their futures. But in spite of a universal patriotism, it often felt as if two different versions of America were jousting at each other. In the cities, particularly in the East, the Midwest, and the Northwest, Americans embraced modernity. In the South and in large sections of the West and rural areas, they resisted it. That created the strange spectacle of a country that was both for racial progress and against it, proud of America's enlarged role in the world and resentful of it, enlightened on the progress of women and determined to keep women in their place. Even when there were victories, the 19th Amendment, for example, which granted female suffrage, it was usually possible to blunt their impact. Mississippi finally ratified the amendment in 1984. The 20s began with more of a whimper than a roar, to judge from January 1920s headlines. Prohibition went, to effect, went into effect on January 17th, to the amazement of many, caught flat-footed by such a radical experiment in social control. On January 29th, 1920, the New York Times reported that an influenza pandemic seemed to be spreading only a year after the one that had killed roughly 50 million people around the world. In New York City alone, 5,589 cases were reported in a single day, with 67 dead from influenza and 118 from complications of pneumonia. Fortunately, this virus turned out to be a milder strain than its predecessor. Some of you may have been reminded of that in the Downton Abbey series. But in other ways, the problems of 1919 lingered. To a degree, these divisions could be papered over as veterans raced to build the American century, freed from wartime exigencies. Two young men who befriended each other in France were Walt Disney and Ray Kroc. As Disney understood, they were ready for new storylines as well. 
As 1920 began, thousands of amateur radio operators began to tinker at home with new sets. And a new company sprang into existence, ready to harness the wireless. On January 5, 1920, the Times announced the creation of the Radio Corporation of America, RCA. And within a few short years, radio would transform the country. Ironically, think of what it might have done at that time to Chautauqua. Ironically, it would empower both sides of the cultural divide, from jazz listeners to the fundamentalists, the latter quite adept at putting this modern tool to work in the fight against modernity. As thousands of Americans bought home radios, it became clear that this new device would transform politics as well as life for many Americans. A pioneer station in Pittsburgh, KDKA, would be the first to cover a presidential election in November of 1920. Even in the dark days of winter, a hundred years ago, there were stirrings as both Democrats and Republicans schemed to replace the sick man in the White House. Wealthy men like William Randolph Hearst and Henry Ford were said to have their eye on the grand residence, but most of the action was inside party circles as B-list candidates tried to step up their game. At the beginning of the year, one of the least likely candidates was a Republican sen senator from Ohio, Warren Harding, who needed to run for higher office because of a strong chance that he would not be reelected to Congress. <laughs> Harding's private life was a mess. He had legions of affairs and had impregnated one of his girlfriends, a young woman named Nan Britton. When her daughter was born in 1919, parentheses confirmed to be Harding's by DNA testing in 2015, it might have ended most presidential careers, but Harding had a talent for coming up with bland phrases that spoke to the country's desire to begin a new era, less complicated. One phrase was normalcy, an invented word that per perfectly encapsulated what many Americans longed for. Another was America first. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout 1920, this anti-Wilson would rise up as the original Wilson wasted away. Harding seemed to have no ideas about anything. One of America's shrewdest observers was the journalist H. L. Mencken. You remember that name? The so-called Sage of Baltimore. From that city, close to Washington, but not of it, Mencken could ridicule both sides of the widening divide and did skewering fundamentalists and eastern eggheads alike. But he worried about the transparent incapacity of a man like Harding. Mencken could be cruel and predicted that if the trend continued of electing candidates with no clear qualifications, the White House would soon be adorned by a complete moron. And that was a quote. As it turned out, normalcy meant an administration that would be ruined by scandal and greed much of it tied to another powerful new force, big oil, engorged with money and influence after helping the war effort. A little bit to think about there. So that was Dr. Widmer's retrospective of 100 years ago, the year 1920, written just two weeks ago, to cause us to wonder what the next 100 years might bring, or at least the next decade. Please take note of your thoughts for now about Winmer's observations to share with us in a bit after we do a Chautauqua retrospective from that era. So let me also mention before I share what we came here to ponder, an article that was in the Buffalo News just this morning. It said, immigration, urban poverty, race and social <coughs> inequities, environmental conservation, Big business and labor, the role of the, of the United States in global affairs. You might think we're rattling off key issues in the 2020 presidential campaign, but WIVB's Katie Alexander notes that identical issues were dominating national politics 119 years ago. She learned this visiting the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site on Delaware Avenue, the place where President William McKinley was assassinated in 1901. And you'll hear all about all these things from Jesse Hurlbut. So you'll hear echoes of this in our talk tonight, and you can ponder the similarities. So let's begin. 
It's been a long time since the winter of 1920, but, but here we sit somewhat scarily at times, thinking that we are still facing many of the existential challenges of 100 years ago, but now in a very different, globalized world. Challenges that few could have foreseen back then. We wonder, were the Chautauquans of 1920 worried about the maintaining of long-cherished ideals? What was Chautauqua thinking 100 years ago? I think we can justify, justifiably surmise, knowing where Chautauqua stands today, that to inhabit a world with lessening ideals, as it might have seemed in 1920, as it does sometimes today, would seem to go against everything that Chautauqua had come to stand for. So let's talk about Chautauqua in its first 46 years of life, written 100 years ago. The book that Greg asked me to comment upon was written by the Reverend Jesse Hurlbut in 1920, and it was titled The Story of Chautauqua. Who was Jesse Hurlbut? Jesse Lyman Hurlbut, who lived from 1843 until 1930, the year in which our own Hurlbut Memorial United Methodist Church <coughs> was dedicated and named after him, was born in New York City graduated from Wesleyan University in 1864 and held pastorates in Methodist churches in Newark, Montclair, Patterson, Plainfield, Hoboken, Morristown, Orange, and Bloomfield, all in New Jersey. He arrived at Chautauqua in the second encampment in 1875, and that began a trajectory that changed his life eventually becoming Dr. Vincent's assistant and later his successor. Arriving here at Fairpoint, by steamer of course, he perceived a sign saying National Sunday School Assembly and that welcomed him to what he perceived to be holy ground. And then the first walk he took was through Palestine Park. He had arrived at his life. Beginning in 1875, Reverend Herbert became directly connected with the Sunday School movement within his denomination and at Chautauqua, which was already leading the country in the Sunday School movement. And he eventually became, with Dr. John Heil Vincent, a leader in the directing of the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, the CLSC which by 1920 had had an enormous impact on the entire country in the latter years of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century. Few, with the exception of the founders, knew Chautauqua as well as Reverend Hurlbut did, or were more qualified to write Chautauqua's story in its then 46-year history. Looking back, he said that Chautauqua was a lusty infant when it entered upon life in 1874, but that it began with a penetrating voice heard afar, in distance, and in decades. And so it did. Let's see what Reverend Jesse Hurlbut wanted the world to know about Chautauqua in the 46th year of its existence. He began by stating that Chautauqua is a place, an idea, and a force. So I'm going to digress immediately, but briefly, to share an observation of his use of the word force to describe Chautauqua. As some of you may know, when I was at Harvard Divinity School, I studied Arabic for two years. One day, I heard the word Chautauqua in a new way. In Arabic, Chautauqua means the will of truth force. And I thought, how interesting. What an amazing coincidence. So when Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf an Arabic speaker, and by the way, not all Muslims do speak Arabic. When Imam Faisal was here with some of his colleagues, I said to them, listen, when I say Chautauqua as Chautauqua, what do you hear? And their eyes all immediately flew open and they said, oh, mashallah, equivalent to amazing. Yes, because they heard the will of truth force. Isn't language interesting? End of digression. 
So Hoba continued by first describing the physical place of Fairpoint in truly lovely poetic language, which you will have to read for yourself. Indeed, the entire book is written in the poetic lyricism of the matter of the day. Hoba pointed out that the location of Chautauqua placed it in a geological watershed for this half of the continent, which figuratively foreshadowed the watershed of learning and progressive thinking that would flow as a force to the whole continent from Chautauqua, the idea. He talked about the significance of the name Chautauqua as a word honoring the native peoples who first blessed these shores, and he gave a nod to the French explorer's pronunciation who called the place Chautauqua, which still exists in the name of the small stream that flows out of the lake, the Chattaquan, as we have anglicized it. He spoke about the portage road of the French from Lake Erie that became an English thoroughfare, and about the Seneca tribe that established a village at Bemis Point, and about the thriving town of Mayville that Chautauqua helped to grow. He talked about its location, so central to the cities of Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland, and especially Jamestown that helped Chautauqua to grow. He, of course, spoke at length about Chautauqua's beloved founders, Lewis Miller and John Heil Vincent, both of whom had had very formative upbringings, but who had not had the privilege of a college education. Hurlbut observed that for Vincent, who was an avid reader, his great sorrow was that he would never realize his intense yearning to experience a college education and that that yearning had, in 1920, already become the entire nation's gain in the work that Vincent would do in his lifetime through Chautauqua to educate the nation through the CLSC. The same is true of Lewis Miller. Both Vincent and Miller, as we know from their very early years, were interested in the education of children and youth and in the strengthening of the church Sunday school. In his first church, as an experiential visual, Vincent created for the Sunday School a replica of Palestine, the Holy Land, and led Sunday School teachers and school children on pilgrimages, put that in quotes, to its sacred places, obviously foreshadowing what would ultimately become a lasting reality in our own Palestine Park, created in the first year of the Chautauqua Sunday School Assembly in 1874 on the shore of Lake Chautauqua. At Trinity Church in Chicago, Reverend Vincent had introduced the quote-unquote uniform lesson plan in the churches of that city, and in 1865, he established the Sunday School Quarterly, later named the Sunday School Teacher. His talent was recognized, and he was called to New York to become the first general agent of the Sunday School Union, directing Methodist Episcopal schools throughout the world and by 1873, one year before Chautauqua's founding, the, the Sunday school lessons were uniform throughout America and, again, the world. He then became editor of the Sunday School Journal with a circulation of about 5,000, which quickly expanded to well over 10,000 and eventually to 200,000. These, these numbers astound me for that era. Herbert stated that his lesson periodicals eventually went into the millions. We can see already the reach that Chautauqua was destined to have, and these numbers make it more plausible that, we are told, approximately 15,000 might have answered the call to the First Assembly at this far-off place called Fairpoint, New York. Herbert stated that the evolution of the Chautauqua idea while born in the first encampment, made great progress in the second encampment. The great assembly, the uh, event of the 1875 year, was the visit of General Ulysses S. Grant, president of the U.S. in his second term, and a longtime friend of Dr. Vincent, who was beginning to become a national powerhouse. As has already been implied, John Howell Vincent of New Jersey and Lewis Miller of Akron, Ohio, were kindred spirits who would ultimately join force in rural New York. Miller was a genius of invention and a practical and wise businessman who invented the Buckeye Mower and Reaper 
1857, which made him both rich and famous. He also had a parallel interest to Vincent in education through the Sunday school, with a graded system centered in a normal school, which led him, normal, capital N, capital S, normal school, that's what they called it, which led him to join forces with Vincent in 1868. Miller was the one who insisted that the Sunday School Assembly be held at Fairpoint, the site of an existing camp meeting, such as was very common in the preceding decades of the century, coming out of the Second Great Awakening of the earlier part of the century's burned over district. That's another story. It would eventually be noted that one of the striking features of the Chautauqua movement as it manifested around the nation would be its out of doors and in the woods habitats, never in the midst of major cities. Think about it. Hurlbut notes that the founders never dreamed that their early decisions of place and of intention would be the architecture of a great educational system that was, and, and he put, this is in quotes, hanging in that balance of those inspired decisions. As stated previously, because Miller and Vincent lacked college educations, Chautauqua grew to become education for everybody, everywhere, and in every department of knowledge and culture. It's the story of an evolution, the Chautauqua Lake Campground Association becoming the Chautauqua Assembly, with a highly structured curriculum designed to keep this is a quote, to keep a quietus on both the religious enthusiast and the wandering Sunday school orator who expected to make a speech at every occasion, <laughs> end quote. We still have a highly structured curriculum for that very purpose. That, that's a little editorial insertion on my part. <laughs> Hurlbut observed that while during the first three to four years of Chautauqua's history, all its aims were in the line of religious education through the Sunday school, but we are not to look for the traits of its later development in those primal days. Ours is truly a story of an evolution and not of a philosophical treatise. Many distinguishing features began very early on to evolve at Chautauqua, one being the advent of a gate fee, 25 cents a day, which necessitated a kind of enclosing of the grounds. Of course, this was resisted by the steamboat operators, as well as the parsimonious attendees, but necessity prevailed. It was noted that the 25 cent fee was half of what was cheerfully handed over when the annual circus came to town. <laughs> Sometimes the question almost came to blows, however, especially from preachers who thought it was their divine right to be afforded entrance to these holy grounds. <laughs> It was, nonetheless, noted that the president of Chautauqua, Mr. Miller, had an uncommonly stiff backbone. And another parenthetical uh, insertion, we might wryly observe that the general resistance to a gate fee has never ceased. <laughs> <laughs> we still hear mutterings. Probit notes that the fee only pertained during the assembly season and that in 1920 there were from 600 to 800 all year long residents on the Chautauqua grounds. Interesting. And that all residents, except for the young and the bedridden old during the season, must purchase tickets. A lease upon Chautauqua property, and the only leased property in those days, did not entitle the holder to admission. Another parentheses here. Somehow that feels consoling today, doesn't it? <laughs> they, had, they suffered as much as everybody does today. <laughs> ah, the Miller backbone still prevails. Doctrinal diversity of a sort began early at Chautauqua as Hurlbut speaks of the quote-unquote Catholicity of the plans for the first assembly that must never be forgotten in that they had no thought to ignore all the various denominations of Christianhood and in fact, included in the program and on the platform, representatives of all denominations present at each assembly, and also provided places on the grounds where the members of each denomination could freely discuss their own problems and provide for their own interests. Indeed, the interdenominational plan was a reality from the beginning. 
This did not prevent a good-natured raillery on the platform between speakers of different denominations, Hurlbut noted, and the crowds actually loved the retorts that would fly back and forth. Hurlbut relays a, a conversation in which a visitor asked him what doctrines were preached and required at Chautauqua. When he replied that there were none, the inquisitor asked incredulously what would be done if a speaker were to attack the doctrines of another church. Hurlbut replied, nothing in the world, except that I am quite certain that it would be his last appearance on the Chautauqua platform. <laughs> uh, we hope that this mutuality of respect, enormously diversified today, may always be so. Of important note, Hurlbut observed, is that Chautauqua was never meant to be a money-making institution. There have always been trustees, but no stockholders, and no dividends, um, parenthetically, I would ask with Tony and Cheek, um, except for those dividends that are, quote unquote, out of this world. That's my line of work. Um, any remaining funds after expenses were to be used for improvement of the grounds and the enlargement of the program. And so it remains to this day. These are some of Chautauqua's foundational principles. What quickly became obvious and compelling early on, Herbert, Herbert of theirs, was that the great work for study and learning, for the providing of lectures on inspiring themes to broaden the learning experience, and for, as he called it, a, quote, spice of entertainment to impart variety, end quote. All of this in a beautiful place to feed the body and soul, all this became a growing necessity for the Chautauqua Assembly and a stated mandate for continuing relevance. Indeed, in the anticipation of the Third Assembly in 1876, with all the planning entailed, there was a growing anxiety about the centennial of the nation in Philadelphia. And it was wondered, could the multitudes from every state and from foreign lands be attracted from Philadelphia 500 miles to Lake Chautauqua? Mm -hmm. Had the quest of the American people for new interests been satisfied by only two years at the assembly? Should they retire for the year, or should they advertise more and bigger? Anyone who knew Miller and Vincent, Hurlbut says, would know the answer. Expanded to three weeks for the first time, from the initial two gatherings, the 1876 assembly began with a scientific conference, no less, aiming to present science both from the Christian point of view and from the scientific point of view, showing the essential harmony between them without either subjecting conclusions of science to church authority or cutting up the Bible at the behest of the scientists. After all, Hurlbut pointed out, Darwin's origin of the, of the species had been presented in 1859, and pulpits had railed against it, mostly without ever having read it, which was also true of many scientists concerning the Bible, he notes. Eminent scholars and preachers did come to the scientific conference and with no restraint were each free to utter their convictions and all with certainty that there would be peace and not war. Speaking of science, by 1879, Chautauqua was illuminated throughout by electricity, helped by Thomas Edison, quote, to begin a new day, end quote. And no one here needs to be reminded that a few years later, Mr. Edison married Miss Mina Miller, Lewis's daughter. The scientific conference in 1876 was followed by a temperance congress presented by the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, pretty much formulated here. The founder and president, Ms. Frances Willard, who led the conference and who had resigned as dean of the women's department of Northwestern University in Chicago to lead the movement until her death in 1898, would have been pleased by the 18th and 19th Amendments had she lived until 1920. Frances Willard, whose Chautauqua House still stands as lovely as ever next to the Chautauqua Women's Club. Anyone familiar with it? Okay, look for it if you're not. It's, it's just to, to the next door. It's the next door to the south of the Women's Club. She was, Frances Willard, was the first woman to be memorialized in the United States Capitol Statuary Hall. Of note, 
Miller and Vincent were both decidedly progressive, but di differed initially on women's issues. Miller wanting women on the platform, but Vincent demurring at first. <clears throat> Frances Willard, however, was the exception, and very soon Vincent concurred wholeheartedly with Miller. Some other innovations to note in 1876. The Assembly Herald was begun by Dr. Theodore Flood, a daily newspaper for the season, so that Chautauqua could tell its own story and not rely on journalists who did not understand the movement. From the beginning, it told the story of the daily programming, and a generation later, it became the Chautauquan Daily, which it remains to this day, which continued throughout the year as the Chautauquan Weekly, telling news of the movement at home and abroad, primarily focusing, as we can assume, on the CLSC movement and news. So parenthetically, I'll say that the class, the CLSC class of 2001 chose Theodore Flood as its honoree. Anyone else besides Jim and me, members of the class of 2001? Hi, class member. <laughs> Another innovation in 1876 was the Children's Hour, which became so popular that the grown-ups came to the meetings in such numbers as threatened to crowd out the children <laughs> until the rule was made that the adults must take the rear seats and must not interrupt. <laughs> Another parenthetical insertion. I laughed when I read this because we have the same challenge today when the Appia, Abrahamic Program for Young uh, Adults program uh, that I run, the Appia coordinators hold porch chats with some of our speakers. The always entitled, I, I lovingly call them oldies but goodies, uh, show up and try to dominate the conversation, so I empower the Appia coordinators to respectfully ask them to sit in the back and stay quiet. <laughs> I know, good luck with that, right? We try. In 1876, another innovation, there were 10 different denominations present, very much present, and 11 men, of course, representing these de denominations were chosen as the committee to prepare and supervise the course of study for the normal school, as it was called, to teach Sunday school teachers. The curriculum was prepared for year-round study in the United States and Canada. Uh, and as a side note, you will remember that the normal school building, you may remember it when it was still called the normal school here, mm -hmm. it was only within the last 20 years, um, uh, was reconstructed and now has become our beautiful theater, um, named after um, Dan Bratton. Another innovation, the choir was first organized in 1876, consisting of 40 voices, which sang prim primarily sang anthems and hymns, but secular music was also introduced in 1876, quote, opening up the whole world of music to Chautauquans, end quote. Dr. Hurlbut also noted that by 1920, the choir had grown to about 300 voices. Rounding out the major innovations for the Third Assembly was its incorporation on April 28, 1876, creating a 24-person board of trustees of the Chautauqua Lake Sunday School Assembly. And I will note with appreciation that I was very privileged to serve on that board of trustees from 1996 to 2004. In 1877, the name Chautauqua became official, and so did its post office. And Mary Lathbury gave Chautauqua the first and most beloved of many songs and hymns, Day is Dying in the West, treasured in 1920 as it is in 2020, to be sung at eventide and for us at the beginning of the weekly Sunday school song service, the weekly sacred song service. 1877 also gave us the beginning of the Chautauqua Salute, which we have mostly forgotten. So let me digress for another minute to share a recent story about the Chautauqua Salute and the drooping of the lilies. These are two kind of um, uh, quintessential and, and we would say quirky uh, traditions that we have. And I realized how quirky when a new Chautauquan recently, in fact only a month ago, made a comment about like, I think it was something like, and I really still don't get what the drooping of the lilies is all about. And I thought, oh boy, we've got work to do. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it was 
a month ago, January 25th, when Greg wrote to me and he said, hey, can you do the, uh, t the talk of February 25th? And I said, oh, that's a month. I better start reading the book. So I picked it up that night, and I just thought, I'm going to page through it just to get a sense of the whole book. Well, I opened to page 275, and don't you know, I opened to The Drooping of the Lilies, and I read as Jesse Hurlbut described it. And then I was paging through the book, and I opened to 111, and it was about the Chautauqua Salute. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is amazing timing. But that's my life. Things like, ha things like that happen to me all the time. So let me, let me just say about the Chautauqua Salute, because it's such a wonderful story. Um, Jesse Hurlbut relates, as Dr. Vincent related to him, that sometime in the latter part of the um, 19th century, and he didn't say what year, uh, but I'm going to say it was around 1877, I think is probably why I put it in this, um, in this part. Um, Chautauqua had invited just to give us a, a, a lecture, a deaf mute from Canada, who gave this lecture using sign language about the parables of Jesus. And he, this deaf mute evidently did such a wonderful job, an amazing job, that at the conclusion of his storytelling, the entire audience of, they said, 2,000 approximately, burst into applause. And Dr. Vincent held up his hand and he said, dear friends, our, our wonderful speaker cannot hear your applause. Let's show him how much we appreciated his lecture. Everyone, please take out their hankies and wave them at him. So they did. Everybody had hankies in those days. Kleenex hadn't been invented. And <laughs> all of a sudden, uh, Dr. Vincent, and, and, and I guess Jesse was there too, all of a sudden, the entire amphitheater, uh, the, the entire gathering at that point, um, just became a sea of beautifully waving white lilies. And it so touched people that from then on, they decided to call it the Chautauqua Salute, a very special way of letting people know how special they were. And so it was used sparingly after that, maybe two to three times a year, for very special guests, until the year 1899, uh, when um, they were remembering and memorializing uh, Lewis Miller, who had just died prior to the season. And instead, uh, uh, and Dr. Vincent said, instead of the Chautauqua salute waving of the, of the lilies, we're going to droop our lilies in memory of Lewis Miller. And so he said, everyone, please raise your lilies and slowly lower them to honor the passing of this great man. And so it has been every all first night that the chairman of our board um, does the exact same um, honoring of all past leaders of Chautauqua. And we still call it the drooping of the lilies. And to someone who doesn't know the background or why, even though the chairman of the board talks about it, it seems, um, it seems strange. But, but it's really a very beloved and long-standing tradition. And we need to help new Chautauquans to understand these long-standing traditions. So, I love those two stories. Getting back to innovations, an especially significant one was on the horizon in 1877. At the closing of the 1877 season, Dr. Vincent gave hints about a new development for Chautauqua that he was planning and that, as Jesse Hurlbut portended, quote, it would become the greatest innovation in Chautauqua's history and perhaps the greatest in the history of education throughout the land, end quote. And this was it. The dream of which Dr. Vincent had spoken was the launching in 1878 of the golden milestone in the history of Chautauqua, the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle, the CLSC. Jesse Hurlbut described the CLSC as that goodly vessel which has sailed around the world, which has carried more than a half a million of passengers, and has brought inspiration and intelligence to multitudes unnumbered. And he said that in 1920.
Hurlbut said that the conception arose in Dr. Vincent's mind from the consciousness of his own intellectual need. He had longed, but vainly, for the privilege of higher education in the college, but in his youth there were no boards of education with endowments extending a helping hand to needy students. Because of his voracious reading, however, Hurlbut said that John Howell Vincent possessed more knowledge and richer culture than nine out of ten men holding college degrees. Vincent longed to help the workers on the farm, in the forge, in the store, in the office, in the kitchen, and in the factory. His longings were like his own. Here, the impact of the CLSC in Jesse Hurlbut's own words. He said, many of us who heard him on that day have thought since that this was the masterpiece of his life. And it might worthily be said to be so, for it launched a movement in education, the most influential and wide-reaching of any in the annals of the nation, and never was the conception of, a Chautauqua, of Chautauqua a reality for all the year long more clearly set forth. It really was Chautauqua all year long in those reading circles that were created all over the country. Responding to the immediate criticism that the goals for the CLSC were too superficial, Dr. Vincent replied, and I just have to read his words because they're too precious. He said, Superficial it is, and so is any college course of study. The boy who stands at the close of his senior year on the commencement day to receive his parchment and whatever honors belong to him, who does not feel that his whole course has been superficial, will not, likely, will not be likely to succeed in the after struggle of life. But superficiality is better than absolute ignorance. It is better for a man to take a general survey to catch somewhere a point that arrests him. For the man who never takes a survey, never catches the point in which dwell the possibilities of power in him. When you sow seed, it is not the weight of the seed put into the soil that tells. It is the weight of the harvest that comes after. You see the brilliance of this man in those few words. There's so much to be said about the CLSC because it was to be monumental in so many ways, but let it suffice to say, in this year of the women, three-fourths of the CLSC members were women, and that the graduates in the early years were women, and that the average age was 30. According to Jesse Hurlbut, quote, if one could ascertain the history of the national women's clubs in the early 20th century, if their origin could be ascertained, it would be found that nearly all of the women's clubs arose out of CLSC members who, after their prescribed courses, took up civics or politics or literature. It would most likely be dis discovered that the General Federation of Women's Clubs of America was an outgrowth of the Chautauqua CLSC movement. So now we have arrived at the year 1879. Don't get scared. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll finish uh, before tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and the Sixth Assembly, which was lengthened to six weeks, and in the interim of five years, boarding houses had been built and opened their doors to guests. That year, 1879, also, also saw the innovation of the School of Languages, School of Languages, regarded as the formal opening of the Chautauqua Summer Schools offering Greek, Hebrew, Latin, German, French, and the Oriental languages. Also offered was the teacher's retreat cur curriculum for secular teachers, presenting the principles and be best methods of education. Recognizing the excellence of the program were such leaders as the secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education and the president of the National Teachers Association, among others. New departments were added every year until Chautauqua became a summer university with nearly 5,000 young men and women diligently seeking higher education. As we all learned in recent years, the first amphitheater was constructed in 1879 and served the assembly until 1897. Let us also remember that 1879 witnessed the creation of the first Hall of Philosophy, later replaced in 1906. With its creation, of this first Hall of Philosophy was initiated the tradition of Sunday Vespers at 5 o'clock and the often <coughs> called Hall in the Grove. In 1880, Chautauqua was already become a convention city and so the Athenaeum Hotel was begun, 
with the addition on the grounds of the first iteration of denominational houses for residential living. By 1880, standards of intellectual offerings were expectantly high and consistently upheld. It was deemed appropriate to have opposing views debated on opposite sides of a question, and a first debate on public questions was held in that year. And so it began that effort is made ever since to have the burning questions of the time discussed by representative speakers. As a whole, however, Chautauqua was not always wholly in accord with the sentiments spoken. Some things don't change. <laughs> The year 1880 also, not surprisingly, saw the advent of the Chautauqua magazine. General James A. Garfield, his party's candidate for president of the United States, came to Chautauqua in 1880 for respite, and the sad fact of history is that he would, within the year, be assassinated. And of course, that's what the Buffalo News was referring to today. The year 1881 celebrated the opening of the Athenaeum Hotel, and the CLSC vigil was introduced with torches to imitate the bonfires of camaraderie reminiscent of the old camp meetings. We can picture, still, the torches surrounding the Hall of Philosophy, which are lit annually only for the CLSC vigil. The year 1882 celebrated the first CLSC Recognition Day, and over 1800 received their CLSC graduation diplomas, 800 of them present on the grounds for the festivities, and all became members of the Society of the Hall in the Grove, the Alumni Association of the CLSC. By the way, there are in this book so many stories of the life-changing impact of the CLSC on personal and communal lives, too, too many to mention for our sharing tonight, so uh, sadly. Um, you'll just have to read the book for yourself. Let one story, however, uh, suffice. Here is a commentary from a visitor that will no doubt still sound familiar today. He said, I have come to Chautauqua to fill up, and I am doing it. But the difficulty is that too many things come up at the same time. <laughs> Lectures too many uh, on too many topics of interest that I never can know which to attend. And then he added, but Chautauqua is a great place, isn't it? <laughs> With regard to religion, which cannot be overlooked, by the year 1882, every season was now witnessing a weekly series of eminent clergymen engaged to serve as chaplains of the week, each man of national and international fame as preachers. And I'm personally happy to say that the standards still hold, but that we now enjoy the preaching of women as well. <laughs> In 1883, Dr. William Rainey Harper, a name that should be possibly familiar, I hope, later to be the first president of the University of Chicago, began as an instructor in the Chautauqua School of Language, teaching Hebrew in the six weeks of courses. He was soon advanced to the position of principal of the summer schools. In his later years, when he was in Chicago, Hurlbut noted that Dr. Harper would take the train every Friday to be at Chautauqua on Saturday and Sunday. By 1884, at 10 years old, the Chautauqua lecturers and visitors were coming from all over the country and the world, and in 1885, the institution received a new charter from the legislature of New York giving the summer school the official name, the Chautauqua University, with the power to operate year-round and to confer degrees. This huge undertaking proved over time to be too demanding, however, in time and resources, and so in 1898, the trustees voluntarily surrendered the examination of candidates for degrees to the regents of the University of the State of New York. The year 1886 brought another innovation. Because most Chautauqua visitors still arrived by steamship, a new pier building was erected and the Chautauqua chimes began to be heard upon arrival. In 1886, the School of Physical Education was established. And thus, the growth of the summer schools was increasing in its range of studies, and the faculty all came from prominent universities from around the country and the world, mostly men, but not all. New departments also included Arabic and the Assyrian language, mathematics, chemistry, oratory and expression, stenography, mineralogy, and geology. In 1888, Dr. Vincent was made bishop in the Methodist Episcopal Church, and the Methodist House was opened that year. Mr. George E. Vincent, son of now Bishop Vincent and a graduate of Yale, 
began to take his place in many categories. In 1888, the CLSC, now 10 years old, listed an enrollment of 80,000, and the summer school became the College of Liberal Arts, with new languages added, such as Sanskrit and the Scandinavian languages appropriate for Jamestown. And Dr. William Rennie Harper now became the principal of the College of Liberal Arts. In 1889, Kellogg Hall was built for the arts and the WCTU, and President Rutherford B. Hayes visited the grounds. And this year, the School of Music came into existence, as did the practice huts, huts originally 48 in number and now 42. Still a lot remaining. And Dr. William Sherwood arrived, who was honored in memory by the Sherwood Memorial Studio, still used today. 1890 welcomed the Presbyterian House, and the School of Expression and the School of Journalism were added and Theodore Roosevelt visited for the first time. In 1891, this, we're moving faster, did you notice? In 1891, the CLSC listed more than 100,000 members, and the Alumni Hall was completed and dedicated. In 1891, the Teacher School became the School of Pedagogy. Also in 1891, the Rabbi of Temple Emmanuel in New York City lectured on the principles of Judaism. And a Roman Catholic priest named Father Edward McGlynn delivered a rebellious lecture in the amphitheater on behalf of religious freedom. Parentheses, it would be in 1893 that the Jewish Chautauqua Society would be formed, but in New York City, not Chautauqua, and it still exists. 1891 also welcomed lectures from the Amp stage on women's suffrage, a perennial topic at Chautauqua with Francis Willard, Anna Howard Shaw, Susan B. Anthony, and Julia Ward Howe all giving orations. That was 1891. Both the Girls Club and the Men's Club were begun in 1892 to be completed in 1893. And as we know, the new amphitheater was also welcomed in 1893 for the 20th Assembly. 1893 also saw the advent of a sewer system created for the sake of not tainting the lake and the sewage carried to the south end was chemically purified, and the sludge was used for fertilizer. An artesian well on high ground provided drinking water. Around this time, 1893, Chautauqua saw the beginning of the formation of many clubs that would evolve over the years, and among them were not exactly in chronological order. The Women's Club, Athletic Club, Golf Club, Croquet Club, replaced by the Roquet Club in the South Ravine, the Quaint Club, you know, like horseshoes, only round. Girls Club, Boys Club, Modern Language Club, Music Club, Press Club, which was a writing club, Lawyers Club, Masonic Club, College Fraternity Club, Bird Tree and Garden Club, College Men's Club, College Women's Club, Octogenarian Club, as well as organizations like the, the, uh, the International Order of the King's Daughters and Sons, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the YWCA Rest and Respite on Pratt, of the Order of the Eastern Star, and the Chautauqua Education Council, and many more. 1894, in 1894, the Department of Elocution became the School of Expression, and the School of Political Science came into being with numerous political leaders speaking and giving courses, including Theodore Roosevelt. In 1894, Helen Keller spoke, as well as the perennial Edward Everett Hale, the well-known author and Unitarian minister. 1895 welcomed the Baptist House. Governor William McKinley of Ohio came a year before he became President of the United States. And the Congress of Mothers began at Chautauqua and then became eventually a nationwide movement uh, that would one day be headquartered in Washington, D.C. In 1896, Dr. William Randy Harper reorganized the schools into the School of Art and the New York Summer Institute for Teachers under the direction of the Regents of the New York State University as well as the School of Sacred Literature, and he included in the faculty Professor Shaler Matthews, who would later become director for the Department of Religion, and very, very famous. Lectures in 1896 included Dr. Booker T. Washington and 10 college presidents, as well as the U.S. Commissioner for Education. In 1897, the School of Domestic Science was born. As I mentioned earlier, most sadly, founder Lewis Miller died in 1899. 
That year, Theodore Roosevelt came for the third time, now as governor of New York, and Jane Addams and Susan B. Anthony both returned. The year 1900 saw the beginning of construction of the Hall of Christ, which would not be completed until 1912, being built as the, as the funding was available. It was conceived by Bishop Vincent for use by the Department of Religion, and I thought I would not overlook the opportunity to mention that. Uh, in, 18, in 1901, uh, we saw the initiation of a school of manual training and also a school of library training under the guidance of Melville Dewey, the New York State Librarian who was there after made a Chautauqua trustee. Someone counting all these schools which seemed to be endless in number. Really amazing. 1902 saw the return of Bishop Vincent from Zurich, Switzerland after being away for two years. And the New York State Legislator took the opportunity, 1902, to bestow a new charter with a new title, the Chautauqua Institution. In 1902, houses were established by the Unitarians, the, then the Lutherans, and the Disciples' Headquarters was enhanced. The Girls' Club was also built. The Labor Movement Conference was held that year with an all-star roster of legislators, educators, labor leaders, and workers. In 1903, Henry Turner, Bailey, grandfather of our own Gretchen Gady, who you know has that beautiful little shop on, on uh, the plaza in the colonnade. He designed the Arts and Crafts Quad, and the Grange Building was built on Simpson. A conference on the problem of alcohol was held, as well as a conference on the mob and the subjects of lynchings, mountain feuds, and organized labor's divisive subjects. But it was noted that Conversations were carried out with perfect courtesy by speakers on opposing sides. In 1904, the work of nature study expanded to include botany and physiography. In 1904, the new electric railway from Jamestown to Lake Erie was inaugurated, connecting to the New York Central Railroad, and thus, for the first time, making the main access to Chautauqua by land, not water. That year, William Howard Taft, soon to be president of the US, gave a lecture, and we wonder how he arrived. In 1905, Theodore Roosevelt became president upon the assassination of McKinley. His address at Chautauqua was the first public announcement of his principles and policies. And that shows you the central position that Chautauqua had in, in, in the US in terms of just about everything. That year also witnessed the completion of the first Colonnade building as the business center, which would sadly burn to the ground two years later. Of interest to us now is that 1906 marked the beginning of the lighting of the flares to let everyone around the lake know that Chautauqua was once again in session. We now light them in harmony with communities all around the lake on the evening of July 4th in mutual celebration. 1906 also celebrated the dedication of the Hall of Philosophy. In 1907, George E. Vincent became president of the institution and Arthur Bester became his assistant. In 1907, the institution all held, also held conferences on the juvenile problem, the juvenile court, public playgrounds, public library, child and state, social unrest, the challenge of socialism, politics, the corporation, and capital and Jane Addams and the Settlement Movement. William Jennings Bryan spoke that year, as did Booker T. Washington, and the beloved Massey Memorial Organ was installed as the largest outdoor organ in the world. The year 1909 brought a new colonnade, the current one, and the new post office arrived, the current one, and it also welcomed the New York Symphony for the first of many participations in the program. President George Vincent opened the season with these words. Chautauqua must be kept in close and sympathetic connection with the great currents of national life. It must be a center from which the larger and more significant movements may gain strength and intelligence support." End quote. Interestingly, a course in Esperanto, the proposed world language, was taught that year. And the second Esperanto, Congress of America was held at the institution. Chautauqua was always in the vanguard, was it not? 
The 1910 focus on the continuing subject of labor was a surprise to some in the Chautauqua constituency and finding a large number of progressive thinkers taking the side of labor against capital. In the same vein, by 1910, numerous scholarships were being offered to help many less financially endowed to enjoy participation in the various schools at Chautauqua, and this would continue to grow every year. In 1911, our beloved Mel Mel Miller Bell Tower was dedicated, and in 1912, a hospital called The Lodge was built. And I believe uh, it was the original use of our current dance studio. It was that building in that location. 1912 also allowed the first partisan political addresses on the platform, with President Taft representing Republicans, Mr. Roosevelt representing progressives, and Mr. Woodrow Wilson, the Democrats. Also noted in 1912 is that the president of Stanford University gave a lecture on the case against war, arguing that the day of wars was past and that the financial interrelation of nations would make war impossible. There were also lectures on, um, there was also a lecture on the international problems in Europe, 1912. Needless to say, at Chautauqua, there was also the perennial lecture on women's suffrage. In 1913, Herbert stated that Chautauqua has always favored the freest discussion of all subjects and has admitted to its platform spokesman upon all the questions of the time and from every point of view. In 1913, the living question was on socialism with arguments for and against. Also argued in 1913 was the single tax, as was the socialist attitude of charity as justice, all getting full and fair hearing. 1913 also saw the advent of natural gas here at Chautauqua. Celebrated in 1914 was the 40th anniversary of Chautauqua and the Reverend Jesse Herbert, who was honored as one of the, quote, survivors of the prehistoric age, and quote, gave an address on <laughs> memories of early days. It was a happy occasion, but then he said, on August 14th, 1914, the storm, the war storm clouds burst for the most terrible war in the history of the world, end quote. At Chautauqua, a war symposium was organized. Given were lectures on the German point of view, the European unrest due to shifts in the balance of power, the French point of view, and the British point of view. Herbert observed, none could have foreseen then that the life of a popular lecturer, Dr. James Hope Moulton, would end soon in the Mediterranean from a shot from a German submarine. 1915 witnessed the resignation of President George Vincent due to his duties as president of the University of Minnesota, and Dr. Arthur Bester then succeeded him as president of Chautauqua. Dr. George Vincent would later go on to become president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And I wonder uh, what connection that was to our being bailed out um, after we went into receivership. Very close. Yeah. Thanks. We'll mention that in a minute. In 1915, the Chautauqua season was still six weeks in duration, with each week devoted to a prominent subject. And the established annual music week was notable that year, 1915, for the presence of the Russian Symphony Orchestra. The session was also in the, uh, the season was also in the preliminary throes of a presidential election with a nation divided by the impending question of U.S. entrance into the war. The years 1917 to 1919 were completely consumed by the effects of war and its aftermath. Herbert seemed to breathe easier in 1919, stating that post-war prosperity and reduction of debt made it a boom year. But he did not elaborate. He did make it known, however, that Chautauqua greatly favored the League of Nations. And that did not surprise me. Uh, how about you? In 1920, which marked Chautauqua's 47th season, Herbert took a retrospective look into history, noting with great sadness that it had begun with the loss of founder Bishop John Hal Vincent in 1920. At his memorial service, Jesse Hurlbut self-proclaimed as the, quote, oldest of living Chautauqua workers, and quote, offered the tribute in Bishop Vincent's honor. Prophetically, 
Probert noted, the 1920 season focused largely on the look forward to women and the new era. Lectures included the president of the General Federation of Women's Clubs, as well as the woman who, for the first time in history, would preside for a day at the Democratic National Convention, which nominated Woodrow Wilson, and also by Miss Mary Garrett Hay, the president of the affiliated Women's Republican Clubs. And parenthetically, you did notice that I did not mention the first two women's names because Herbert identified them by their husbands' names. <laughs> so, the rest of the book, Herbert, uh, the rest of the book, in the rest of the book, Herbert uh, devoted uh, to the daughters of Chautauqua. Put that in quotes. All those Chautauquas all over the country that were spawned by the CLSC, which he estimated at the time to be as many as approaching a thousand around the country. But that story would be worthy for another time, not tonight. <laughs> You'll notice I did not say much about two very important traditions of our beloved Chautauqua, and those are our Old First Night celebration and the CLSC Recognition Day traditions and rituals, which were mentioned all through the book, all through the book, and which have in many ways been part of the heart glue that has permeated through the years and kept Chautauqua so relevant to so many and so heart-centered for 146 years. Traditions such as these must never be watered down or jettisoned because Chautauqua will have lost part of its soul and spirit without them. What we must do, however, is more effectively communicate the history and relevance of these traditions and rituals and help new Chautauquans to love these time-honored manifestations of our history and to engender in new Chautauquans the devotion and commitment to Chautauqua with which we hope that all Chautauquans down through the years will treasure and preserve this unique, in all the world, place, idea, and force. Our rituals are snapshots into our history, and they are precious. We humans are ritual creatures, which is the hallmark of our humanity. Rituals are also the essence of relationship. George Vincent observed in 1920, and I quote, that if Chautauqua ever becomes a business or a resort, it will die. I hear that as saying that if we ever forget what we love and stop seeing Chautauqua as a precious community of people, place, and ideas, and begin to see Chautauqua as a commodity, we will lose it. We are, with great caring, currently in the process of figuring out how to do that, how to love and treasure who we are, and to figure out for the next hundred years how we can stay viable and relevant to the world in order to do that. That is the essence of the strategic plan recently formed by our Board of Trustees. So that's the first 46 years, with great thanks to Reverend Dr. Jesse Hurlbut and to Greg. Mm -hmm. And it is a great jumping off point for which to remember who we are and how we came to be, and to treasure this mm -hmm. one-of-a-kind legacy that divine providence has blessed us to own. Are you as amazed as I am about how much relevance to today Chautauquan, to, to, to today Chautauquans and the world of 100 years ago we're experiencing? Especially when we know how much the world and Chautauqua has continued to evolve. Think about how radio, so new in 1920, was beginning to impact Chautauqua. Think about all the factors of today that cause us to reevaluate each season. What thoughts come to your minds to keep Chautauqua relevant and thriving for the next hundred years? <coughs> That's the challenge that we face every single year. So, so what would you want to share tonight? How about an applause, first of oh. all? <laughs> to go back and um, to appreciate and to realize that for 146 years Chautauqua has been extremely relevant. It really is one of a kind. When I quote the, the great historian Dave McCullough who said, there is no place like Chautauqua, not any place in the world, and there is no place that has anything like its history. 
I think he's absolutely correct. So what would anyone like to share before we have to leave? <laughs> yeah. I just can't help but uh, reflect on how the value of education prevailed throughout. And maybe that is, maybe that's, and, and education for the, uh, for people who maybe didn't have access to it. Mm -hmm. That was, that was prevailing during the time, but I can't help but think that that may be one of the themes that, that valuing of the sharing of good ideas and thoughtful ideas and the best of ideas so that people can then take them on to their lives or to their communities, just like CLSC does and did. Mm -hmm. In, in a different time that, that maybe has access to different kinds of media. So you're, you're so right on when you say to experience here, to learn here, and then take what you learn back to your, your communities. Um, we have said, for, well, not, I don't know, from the beginning, but for a long time, that we actually um, created the learning vacation. Um, that it was meant to be a respite for people. That's why Miller especially wanted it here on this lake. He wanted it to be in, a, in kind of a, a pastoral rural setting. Now we say it's a little hard to get here. Um, but, but it's been this um, time away from the busyness of cities and um, other forms of civilization that has given people the time and space to think and learn. And then to take back what they learned to their communities and make a difference. And we still, that's still our motivation. That's still what we, when we, we try to come up with themes and um, points of view that will help people to, to think, to help their own lives and to help uh, society and the larger world. That's really, it's a prayer. It's a real prayer. Yeah, thank you. Other thoughts? Yeah. Terry? This is, um, I, I don't have a lot to say on the subject, but simply the ERA, uh, Equal Rights Amendment, as it's percolated up, uh, and this is an important year for that, coincidentally with 120 years of women's suffrage and all of that influence from Chautauqua. Yeah. What, what does that mean now? Where do we go now? Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? uh, it's kind of a mixed bag, I think. It is. And there are pockets in the world where that sort of thinking um, and those values have not, uh, mm -hmm. have not manifested yet. But if you ask me, from my point of view, I think um, whatever we would call the feminine charisms, of caring, community, collegiality, nurturing, those feminine charisms, which don't reside in women only. They're very much present in men, thank God. Um, and I think they're becoming more present in men. When you look at the millennial generation, they're much more, um, men are much more um, showing those feminine charisms. And the, the, the so-called masculine charisms of, of competition and domination, et cetera, that you know, we, we call patriarchalism, I think it's on the wane. I think there is the rising in, in our era um, going forward of, of the feminine. And I think it's going to save the world. Um, I really do. I think it's going to save the world. Well, I mean, not overstate things, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, Robin. Um, I think like everybody, I'm struck by the parallels between 100 years ago and today. And I found that equally sad and comforting. So, and so I would say that when you ask the question of what should we, how do we think about the next hundred years, I would say as long that we already have the themes that are important that we've struggled with probably as a species forever uh, and that to concentrate on those values and those themes is what we need to do for the future. 
we just will have different technology to do it with, <laughs> or different vocabulary, but the same value set, maybe. That's all. Yeah, and, and the ability to have um, values be uh, transmitted. Right. More so. As long year. as we stick to that, though, well, that's, the, that's the hard part of not getting uh, co opted into, you know, money or power or those other things, which, which are real concerns, but which can't take the forefront. Can I share a little poem with you? I don't want to cut anything, anyone off from whatever you would like to share, though. <coughs> So I would yeah. say that, that cycling around the same themes over and over isn't just repetition, though. It, can, it is actually kind of a spiral mm -hmm. that goes somewhere, even though, it, and it comes up against enormous obstacles, bigger and bigger obstacles, I guess, as it progresses. Progresses is the word. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'd just like to share a um, brief story of love regarding the Miller Tower, which is oh. probably one of the, well, there's many landmarks here. Can everyone hear Pat? Mm -hmm. the, the Miller Tower is, we live practically across the lake from here mm -hmm. every day. And uh, I just wrote, I scribbled it, so I'm, <laughs> Chautauqua was a place called the Miller Tower, where our dear friend's parents became engaged there many years ago. Each year they would return to the tower and exchange their vows and proclaim their love for each other. This couple from Ripley are both gone now. Uh, they were neighbors of mine, though their love remains in the heart of their children and their grandchildren. Oh, lovely. Thank you. So that brings up the Zach theme from uh, the, the beginning of our time together. Today. Yeah, John. I read something to the folks at dinner this evening that I had found about women. Women are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they are until they get into hot water. <laughs> well, that's also true. <laughs> that's what Thanks. Yeah, Sonny, what do you want to say? Yeah, uh, well, thank you so much uh, for this beautiful uh, presentation. I learned a lot, and for someone who is uh, just starting to learn about Chautauqua and uh, trying to fall in love with this place, I think this is really our opinion uh, to see uh, the uh, disagreement, you know, the challenges, they are not new. Uh, we are not really special and we all can learn from the past. And uh, that is, for me, the thing that I love the most about Chautauqua is the idea of uh, coming here and be challenged. Uh, it's not just sitting on the lake and uh, enjoying this beautiful place, but challenge with ideas. And I think that is the most important thing in it. Because if we were to come here and listen to uh, the ideas that we already agreed with, uh, the things that we have done, we'll go back and we'll have no reason to uh, think about them or to discuss them with people. It's through those challenging ideas that we are exposed to them and then we have uh, the opportunity to go back home and either to discuss them further with people or to read about them. And I think uh, that is not something we should shy away from when we have those uh, challenging ideas coming in. And uh, although we have to relax, for the CLC, uh, uh, part of Shtakwa, was that was part of it. And most of the uh, uh, books uh, I look at the past they have chosen, they were not good books that were uh, just for fun. They were trying to teach people, but they always couple them with uh, fun books we can enjoy. And uh, those books, now when we're looking, they shape the present. And maybe that's the way we have to think about challenging those ideas and uh, make sure that the future we are shaping or reflected on them, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, like I was saying, the idea of Chautauqua cannot be something that is easy, and when we come here, it cannot be something that we just uh, take and, and forget. 
Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here tonight. And what you're saying is, and, and that was so much in harmony with what Cynthia was saying about the spiraling upward, basically, um, uh, and the waking up that education does for us. Education wakes people up. And I think that's what Chautauqua has been about. So I, I don't want to cut anyone off. Does anyone else want to share, please, before we go? Yeah. Okay, John? I uh, came to Jamestown in 1964 to work for the CPA firm Seaman and Seaman. My first job was the audit of Chautauqua. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in my professional life with Chautauqua. Oh. I learned to love it. But uh, I wanted to mention, too, that uh, Chautauqua was mentioned in the IRS code mm -hmm. for the not for profit organizations back when that was uh, oh. Sam Lasher. Some of you may remember was one of the people that oh, got right. that yeah, through yeah. the IRS to exempt status for Chicago. Here, here. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. Yeah, no. No, God bless that. Um, okay, well, I so appreciate your, your, your um, kind appreciation. I have to stand up to say this little poem for you. Um, because, um, you know, we talk about spiraling and waking up and education waking us up. Back in the 80s, I came across this poem. It's the closing soliloquy of a play from the 60s by Christopher Fry, and it's called The Sleep of Prisoners. And I always took it when I first read it to understand that the human species has been, since our evolution over eons, that we have been waking up from an ignorance um, of sleeping you know, sleeping, we're waking up. We've been ignorant and little by little, we are growing in awareness and enlightenment through education, um, which comes in many forms. As you saw for all those schools, and I counted them, there, there were 12 schools, by the way. Um, but here it is, it's called The Sleep of Prisoners, and this is the closing soliloquy. And you'll see why it's relevant. The human heart may go the length of God, Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the sound of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the greatest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God, the whole, W-H-O-L-E. So what are we waiting for? It takes so many thousands of years to wake. So will we wake, for pity's sake? <laughs>